Hey everybody, welcome back to another True Crime kind of Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the serial killers, the Hart brothers. Two brothers, or first cousins, no one's really sure. Whatever the case may be, they were horrible people. <laughs> they killed, they raped, they burned, they destroyed, they did a lot of things. So, sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. Historians note the difficulty between deciphering facts about the Hart brothers and the later legends of their exploits, as there are very few records from the time period still around. They are believed to have been born in what is now Orange County, North Carolina, to Scottish parents. Makaja was probably born in or before 1768 as Joshua Harper, and Willie in or before 1770 as William Harper. Though many historical accounts identify them as brothers, it is also possible that they were first cousins named Joshua and William Harper who immigrated from Scotland in 1759 or 1760. According to this theory, their fathers were brothers, John and William Harper, who settled in Orange County, North Carolina between 1761 and 1763. Like many Scottish settlers of the American colonies, the Harpers were Calvinists and avowed Tories loyal to the king. Prior to the American Revolution, Big and Little Harp's fathers may also have served in Tory militias in the War of Regulation, or the Regulator War, from 1765 to 1771, during which colonists in the Carolinas took up arms against the continuing loyal government interference by British colonial officials. When the Revolutionary War began, the Harp's fathers tried to join in the Patriot American forces, but were refused because of their earlier association with British loyalists. The treatment of the Harp family by hostile Patriot neighbors may have contributed to Big and Little Harp's feelings of persecution and their desire for revenge against people they considered rebellious traitors who were still the British subjects of King George III. Around April or May 1775, the young Harps left North Carolina and went to Virginia to find overseer jobs on a slave plantation. Big Harp later traveled in the company of two women, Susan and Betty Roberts, possibly sisters, both of whom bore him children. Little Harp married Sarah Sally Rice, the daughter of a Baptist minister. Little is known of the Harp's precise whereabouts at the outbreak of the American Revolution. According to the eyewitness account of Captain James Wood of the Continental Army, they joined the Tory rape gang in North Carolina. The predatory loyalist criminalists took advantage of wartime lawlessness by raping, stealing, murdering, burning, and destroying property, especially the farms of Patriot colonists. The Harves gang took part in the kidnapping of three teenage girls, with a fourth being rescued by Captain Wood. The Harps also served as military associators who were not provided soldiers' uniforms, weapons, and pay by the British government. Like many other Loyalist volunteers, they had to survive by forging, robbing, and, and the looting of battlefields. Captain Wood's son, Frank Wood, a Patriot soldier of the frontier over mountain men, and the older brother of Susan Wood, who was later kidnapped and made the wife of Makaja Harve, Frank Wood claimed to have seen the Hart brothers serving loosely as Tory militia, at the Battle of Kings Mountain in October of 1780, under British commander Major Patrick Ferguson. During the three-hour engagement, Wood took aim at Big Harp, but missed his target. Later, the Harp served under the commandment of Lieutenant Colonial Vanstray Tarleton's British Legion at the Battles of Blackstocks in November 1780 and Cowpens in January of 1781. Following the decisive British defeat, by Patriot and French forces at Yorktown in 1781, the Harps left North Carolina, dispersing with their Native American allies, the renegade Chickamauga Cherokees, to Tennessee villages west of the Appalachian Mountains. On April 2nd, 1781, they joined war parties of 400 Chickamauga to attack the Patriot frontier settlement of Bluff Station at Fort Nashboro which is present-day Nashville, Tennessee, which would be assaulted by them again on either July 20th, 1788, or April 9th, 1793. On August 19th, 1782, the Harps accompanied a British-backed 
Chickamauga Cherokee War Party to Kentucky at the Battle of Blue Licks, where they helped to defeat an army of Patriot frontiersmen led by Daniel Boone. During the Harp's early frontier period among the Chickamauga Cherokees, they lived in the village of Nickajack near Chattanooga, Tennessee for approximately 12 or 13 years. During this time, they kidnapped Maria Davidson and later Susan Wood. In 1794, the Harps abandoned their Native American habitation before Nickajack was destroyed in a raid by American militia. The Hart brothers would later relocate to Powell's Valley around Knoxville, Tennessee, where they stole food and supplies from local pioneers. They may have disguised their Tory past from their Patriot neighbors by changing their original name of Harper, which was a common Loyalist surname in Revolutionary War era North Carolina. The whereabouts of the Harps are unknown after the summer of 1795, but by the spring of 1797, they were apparently dwelling in a cabin on Beaver's Creek near Knoxville. On June 1st, 1797, Willie Harp married Sarah Rice, which was recorded in the Knox County Marriage Records. So now during 1797, the Harps began a vicious crime spree through Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. The Harps later confessed to the killings of a confirmed 39 people, but the estimated combined total, including unknown victims, may as well be as high as 50. What follows are the accounts of a few of the murders they committed. In 1797, while the Harps were living in Knoxville, Tennessee, they were driven from the town after being charged with stealing hogs and horses. They were also accused of murdering a man named Johnson, whose body was found in a river covered in urine and ripped open with the chest cavity filled with rocks to weigh it down. This became a signature corpse disposal method of the Harps' serial killings. They reportedly butchered anyone at the slightest proclamation, and they killed babies. Killing men is one thing. Killing babies. That's something else. From Knoxville, the Harps fled north into Kentucky. They entered the state on the Wilderness Road near the Cumberland Gap. They uh, were believed to have murdered a peddler named Peyton, taking his horse and some of his goods. In December, they murdered two travelers from Maryland. Next, a man named John Langford, who was traveling from Virginia to Kentucky, turned up dead, and a local innkeeper pointed the authorities to the Harps. The criminal pair were pursued, captured, and jailed in the state prison in Danville, Kentucky, but they managed to escape. When a posse was sent after them, the young son of a man who assisted the authorities was found dead and mutilated by the Harps in retaliation. On April 22, 1799, Kentucky Governor James Garrard placed a $300 reward on each of the Harps' heads. Fleeing northward, the Harps killed two men named Edmonton and Stump, when they were near the mouth of the Saline River in southern Illinois, they came upon three men encamped and killed them. The pair then made their way to Cave in a Rock, a natural cave on the bluffs above the Illinois bank of the Ohio River in a stronghold for river pirates and the criminal gang leader, Samuel Mason. A posse had been aggressively pursuing them, but stopped just short of the cave on the opposite shore in Kentucky. With their wives and children in tow, the Harps holed up with Samuel with the Samuel Mason gang, who preyed on slow-moving flatboats making their way down the Ohio River. While the Mason gang could be ruthless, even they were appalled by the actions of the Harps. And when you got people who are really messed up, appalled by what you're doing, there's a problem. After the murderous pair began to to make a habit of kidnapping travelers, taking them to the top of the bluff, sh stripping them naked, and then throwing them off, Samuel Mason forced them to leave. Good decision. <laughs> the Harps then returned to eastern Tennessee, where they continued their vicious murder spree. They killed a farmer named Bradbury, a man named Hardin, and a boy named Coffrey in July of 1798. Some more bodies were discovered, including those of William Ballard, who had been disemboweled and thrown in the Holton River. James Brassel, who had his throat viciously slashed and was discovered on Brassel's knob, and John Tooley. John Graves and his teenage son were found dead with their heads axed in south-central Kentucky. In Logan County, the Harps killed a little girl, a young slave, and an entire family they found asleep in their camp. In August of 1799, 
A few miles northeast of the Russellville, Kentucky, Big Harp bashed his own in his infant daughter's head against a tree because she was crying. The constant crying bothered him so much that he took his own daughter's head and slammed it against a tree, killing her. And this crime was the only crime that he said he actually felt bad about. The same month, a man named Torridge was found disemboweled in Highland Creek. When the Harps were given shelter at the Stigall home in Webster County, the pair killed an overnight guest named Major William Love, as well as Miss Moses Stigall's four-month-old baby boy, whose throat was slit when he cried. When Miss Stigall screamed, because, you know, it's a kid who just got slit, your throat slit, you know, then she was murdered. The second governor of Kentucky, James Gard, issued a government proclamation on April 22nd, 1799, in the name of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, declaring a $300 reward for the apprehension and deliverance back to Danville, Kentucky, for trial. Governor Gard gave a description of the physical appearances of the Hart brothers. Makaja Harp, alias Roberts, is about six feet high of robust make and is about 30 or 32 years of age. He has an ill-looking downcast countenance and his hair is black and short, but comes very much down his forehead. He is built very straight and is full flushed in the face. When he went away, he had on a stripped nakeen coat, dark blue woolen stockings, leggings of drab cloth, and trousers of the same as the coat. Willie Harp, alias Roberts, is very McGray in his face, has short black hair, but not quite so curly as his brother's. He looks older, though really younger, and has likewise a downcast countenance. He had on a coat of the same stuff as his brother's, and had a store coat over the closed-bodied one. His stockings, dark woolen ones, and his leggings of drab cloth. The Harp killings continued in July of 1799, as the two fled west to avoid a new posse organized by John Lapierre, which included the avenging husband and father, Moses Stigall. While the pair was preparing to kill another settler named George Smith, the posse finally tracked them down on August 24, 1799. The posse called for the Harps to surrender. They attempted to flee. Uh, Makasha was shot in the leg and back by Lapierre, who soon caught up with him and pulled him from his horse, subduing the outlaw with a tomahawk in a scuffle. As he lay dying, Makaja confessed to 20 murders. While Harp was still conscious, Moses slowly cut off his head. Now, by the way, he's alive when he's doing this. So he's cutting off Makaja's head while he's alive. Later, the head was spiked on a pole, some accounts a tree, at a crossroads near the Moses de Gaulle cabin that is still known as Harp's Head or Harp's Head Road, along a modern-day highway in Webster County, Kentucky. Willie Harp successfully escaped the confrontation and rejoined the Mason Gang pirates at Cave and Rock. Four years later, Willie had been captured along with the rest of the gang, but went unrecognized because he was using the alias John Stenton or Stutton. Both Harp and Samuel Mason, the gang leader, escaped, but Mason was shot. Afterwards, Little Harp and another gang member, Peter Alston, who went by the name of James May, son of the counterfeiter Philip Alston, tried to claim the bounty on Samuel Mason. Although it is unclear whether Mason died from the wounds sustained during the escape or whether Harp killed him. Regardless, as they presented Mason's head, the Kentuckian recognized Harp and Alston as outlaws themselves, and the two men were arrested. The two soon escaped, but were quickly recaptured, tried, and sentenced to be hanged. In January of 1804, Willie and Peter were executed by hanging. Their heads were cut off and placed high on stakes along the Natchez Trace as a warning to other outlaws. <laughs> this is one of the worst drawings I think I've done in a while. Sorry. I come back from vacation and my drawing skill has left me. I think it's gone off to Narnia or some distant land because this is... Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't take weeks off because my drawing goes to shit. But to conclude, uh, there isn't really much to say. They did get taken down, so that's nice. One died for getting shot at from a posse. The other one got away for about four years before being noticed and then was hung, so I don't know which one is better. Um, but they were horrible people. There was no rhyme or reason they didn't have a specific set of people they killed. With most serial killers, they have a type. Brown hair, blue eyes, look like their mom. <laughs> or 
like girls in general or guys or they have a specific type that they go for well these two they didn't care they just killed whoever got in their way like if they were just traveling and this dude was walking beside them they're like shank disembowel them throw them in a river or something it's like dude it's you're just killing people for the reason of killing which you don't killing for any reason is horrible but when you're killing for a reason at least like there's a motive there but like with these guys they just didn't care that's why it was hard to catch them at first because they were just like killing random people and you're like uh what i mean one of them killed their own kid crying too much slam her head against a tree no that's not how you react to a baby crying they also slit another baby's throat so they're not really good people obviously they're not good people you see the stuff they did the only thing that I did not agree with, with their, um, sentencing or whatever, is that both of them had their heads chopped off and put on sticks. I feel like that's a little aggressive. Just a thought. I mean, yeah, they were serial killers, and they were just horrible people in general, but putting their heads on sticks, I don't know, seems a little gruesome to me. Um, especially because the first brother, I think it was Big Harp, he died first. Um, his head was cut off while he was still alive, so he felt his head being cut off, which is just, um, not fun. Like a slow guill guillotine, you know, like where they'd cut people's heads off, but that was a quick slice. Alright, this was slow. I don't know how the he cut the guy's head off. I don't know if it was a knife, a saw, like I don't know what he had with him. I'm gonna guess a knife. So that's slow. And he'd probably bleed out before his head is, is actually off, obviously. But he would feel some of it while he's dying. So, like, he was alive when his head got cut off, which is just even worse. Um, his other, well, his brother, or cousin, um, was hung. And then his head was cut off. So he was already dead when they cut his head off and put it on a stick. Which gives me, um... What was it? Vlad the Impaler vibes, except he wouldn't put their heads on sticks. He'd put their entire body on a stick. But same vibes and i feel like this is just a tad aggressive they were trying to warn other outlaws be like yeah don't don't go against the law we're gonna put your head on a stick basically and i feel like i guess it's a good scare tactic but also like kind of fucked up but that's my opinion i'm not siding with the killers the Hart brothers are terrible people were terrible people they deserved the punishment that they got but maybe putting their heads on sticks was a little far <laughs> just saying um, I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. I'm glad to be back. Alright, see you guys later.